We are delighted to be rejoined by one of our favourite guests for UK Director of Answers in Genesis, our friend and author, Simon Turpin. Hello and welcome back, Simon. Hi, David. Good to be with you again. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Good to see you. We really enjoyed our conversation a year or so back, but for anyone that didn't catch that, remind us of everything that we need to know about you in 60 seconds. Well, as you said, I'm the Executive Director and Speaker for Answers in Genesis in the UK, which is a, an apologetics ministry. Um, it deals specifically with the issues of creation and the flood. I'm married um, to my wife, Jessica. We have seven children and we home educate them. So that's that's a busy, busy job, Ben Simon, right? It is. It is indeed. But we're, we're really glad of, of the work we do and, of you know, to to be able to educate the ch our children in the way we do. Yeah. So it's it's a busy life, but um, God is, is really blessed us and we're really thankful for everything that's going on. Yeah, amazing. You've written a brand new book titled Scoffers. Give us an overview of that book and also tell us how you come to write it. Well, the book, um, David, is based upon um, 2 Peter chapter 3. Um, so it's sort of an exposition uh, and an analysis of where we are today based upon um, 2 Peter 3. And basically, I, I came to write the book because there's, there's a lot of material out there written on you know creation on the floods scientific arguments but i really wanted to do sort of an exposition from scripture something that had never been done before so i decided to break um 2 peter 3 specifically chapter 3 down um verse by verse and exegete it but then apply it to um the creation evolution argument that's going on today and they also actually used um two chapters based upon chapter one in two Peter, where Peter argues basically um, that we weren't following cleverly devised myths. And he talks about the inspiration of the scripture. So I use those to, 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 to tackle, you know, is Genesis a myth? Is it just like the ancient myths? And what about the inspiration of scripture? Because that's under attack today. So th yeah. that's sort of the framework for the book. Yeah, excellent. We have an international audience. So please bring us up to speed with what the temperature is like within Christianity and the culture in the UK today towards the faith in holding biblical views on creation and the flood? Yeah, well, I don't know where people are in the world, but in the UK, it's um, it's it's really cold towards Christianity. I know that you probably know that. I think the statistics would tell us, you know, of a population of 60 million plus, about 4% of people in, in the UK go to church on a Sunday. Um, so that tells you what, what the, the flavor for Christianity is like. And we know that many Christians are starting to really feel now opposition for their faith. Lots of Christians have been taken to court for um, doing evangelism in the streets, that have been taken um, to court for um, um, their beliefs about home education, they've been taken um, to court for actually withdrawing their children out of schools to do with issues of transgenderism. There's a, there's a big case going on. Um, friends of ours, actually, who are in the news at the moment for that. So, yeah, spiritually, um, you know, there's there's a big thing going on in the UK. But I, actually, David, I was out on the streets um, at the weekend working with a friend of mine from the Open Air Mission in the UK. And we had a great time, you know, sharing God's word, preaching the word, speaking to people about the gospel. And so although um, the culture is, is very much opposed to the gospel, you know, we, we very much see people who are in desperate need of the truth yeah. that Jesus is Lord and he can save them from their sin. Yeah. And God is still at work, right? Amen. Yeah, he is yeah. doing good things. Yeah. We've mentioned that the book is called Scoffers. What is a scoffer and how should we look to engage with them? Well, David, Proverbs 21, 24 basically tells us a scoffer is someone who acts with arrogant pride. And, you know, we don't have to go far to find people who scoff at the Bible. And in, in, in the book, actually, I break it down to, to talk about some of the scoffing uh, that goes on because people will often scoff at us for our stance on creation the call us fundamentalists literalists um you know the all these other words you know stupid ignorant yeah. um but those are what we call the, the logical fallacies called epitaph fallacies when when you use biased or emotional language to try and defeat an argument rather than using logic and reason and you know that's a a tactic scoffers not just outside the church will use but even scoffers within inside the church, people who find, you know, creation and the flood accounts embarrassing. And so they talk about these literalists in the church, you know, they're embarrassing to us. But 
That isn't a, a logical argument. It's not based upon sound reasoning principles. It's basically, as I said, it's an epitaph fallacy. It, it's using biased language to try and defeat an, um, an opponent. And what I try and say in the book is that these scoffers come along and they attack the doctrine of creation. They attack the doctrine of the flood. And that's laid out actually in the New Testament. You know, we live in an era David, where we see this great attack over the last 200 years upon the foundational chapters in the book of Genesis. Yet that's outlined in a book that was written you know, well over 2000 years ago. And so that should wake Christians up to what's going on in the culture. Yeah, for sure. Let's tackle both of the key themes of the book. Firstly, creation. What are the most commonly held wrong views and what does the Bible say? Well, you know, David, there's, it's like a, a plethora out there of all the different views on creation. You know, there's the day-age theory, the idea that the days in Genesis are long periods of time. The gap theory, which would say there's a gap in the first couple of verses in Genesis where you can sort of add all the millions of years, all the deep time that you need to accommodate to. There's, um, you know, a position which is probably the predominant position in the church in this country, in the UK, um, theistic evolution, the idea that God um, used evolution to, to create the world. There's, there's the idea um, that Genesis 1 isn't teaching history, it's just teaching theology, which is called the literary framework position. There's, there's lots and lots of, of different theories. But what we try and say to people is, look, although those theories exist and many Christians and, and theologians hold to those positions, is that none of those positions actually come from the text of scripture. Not, not one of them come from an exegesis of, of Genesis chapter one or from the rest of, 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 of the Bible. They're all imposing the idea on scripture because they're all trying to fit one thing into the Bible. They're all trying to fit the idea of evolution and the idea of millions of years into the text of scripture. So that's why we have all these different views on Genesis and one of the things I try and point out in the book is actually the traditional view of Genesis, the exegesis of, of, of the view that comes from an exegesis of the Bible, um, you know, a grammatical historical approach is that the days in Genesis are six normal 24 hour days. And when you look at the genealogies um, in scripture, that leads us to, to the understanding that the world's about 6,000 years old. And I pulled two people out from church history who actually used the biblical teaching on creation um, to tackle false views in the culture, to tackle the pagan um, views of the time. One was a second century church father named um, Theophilus, who um, dealt with someone, um, Autoclycus, who was a pagan, who was trying to challenge him on his view of creation. And, and he actually says, look, the reason we know our view is correct is because you can look at creation and you can see how God created. And when you, you read the text, we haven't been here for the eons and eons and eons you Greeks um, talk about. We've only been here for about 6,000 years. And another man who's well known, um, the reformer, Swiss reformer, John Calvin. Actually, well, you know, many people think of when they think of evolution and creation and the age of the earth, they think of Darwin and it's a modern idea. But Calvin had to do had to deal with rather um, some some philosophers in his day who were basically teaching um, a form of Epicureanism. If you remember Paul on Mars Hill, Paul had to deal with the Epicureans. And basically he recognizes, look, they scoff at this view that God created the world and he created it in six days and he created it a few thousand years ago. But Calvin says, look, the scripture is too powerful for, for us to be embarrassed by, you know, that's what will defeat these scoffing mentalities. So when you look back um, through church history, David, that the, the biblical view is the one that's been held by the majority of the church. It's not until the late 1800s that you really see that position being challenged through the idea of evolution and millions of years. Yeah, really helpful. Great stuff. And the second key theme is the flood. Again, tell us about some of the different views that you hear, probably almost in your job on a daily basis, I'd imagine, Simon. Yeah, well, there's, there's a couple, you know, the, the, the two alternative, obviously the biblical view that we would say when you read the text is obviously that um, the flood in Genesis and the New Testament perspective is that of a global flood, that the waters of that time covered the entire globe. But because of the influence of 
um, the age of the earth and the geologic column being laid down slowly over millions of years, Christians have realized, well, if that's true, if, if that is what we believe, that the world is millions of years old, then you can't really hold to a global flood because the global flood would do away with the geologic column. So they basically either have to say, well, the flood was maybe a local flood somewhere in the Mesopotamian Valley, or the flood never happened. It was just a myth. And there's many teachers like, um, for example, William Lane Craig, a famous Christian apologist, he holds to a view called the mytho-historical view of Genesis. And he, he, he says, well, if you read the text, it does give the impression of a global flood, but science contradicts that, so we can't believe that. So he talks about the idea that it's just basically mytho-historic. So there's all these different ideas, but again, David, none of them are coming from the text. And if we believe God has inspired his word, then we need to, to look at what God has said. And when you look at the text, it is clear it's a global historical flood. Genesis 7:19 tells us all the high mountains under the heavens were covered. And again, Peter clearly in 2 Peter chapter 3, as a layout, believes that the flood was global because he's arguing, you know, that God's going to judge the world again in the future. And he did it in the past through a, a global event of the flood. Yeah. And he's going to do it again. And it's going to be a global judgment. And so, you know, he clearly understood the flood as a global event. Yeah, brilliant. We live in an age where a lot of people are interested in climate change. How important is it to understand the flood when considering this? Very important. If you if you reject the, the history that's there in the book of Genesis, David, then basically then you're going to have to hold to the same view um, of, of man-made climate change that many of the secularists hold to today. You know, the flood is the key to um, climate change because after the flood, the Bible tells us that, you know, as long as seed time harvest remains, you know, the seasons will, will, will go on continuing until Till, till the end of the world. And so, you know, God is, is, is the one in control of, of the world. The seasons will still be there. Um, there's, there's not going to be too much, you know, nothing's going to happen that's going to be drastic again. God is not going to judge the world again through another, another flood. So those seasons will remain. But the flood would have upset the balance of things, and that would have changed the climate of the time. And you see actually different you know after, after the flood you read read of different accounts of famine in the bible in fact when you think of genesis 13 i talk about the account of abraham and um lot and sodom in there i don't know if i mentioned this in the chapter but you know when when lot views the jordan valley one thing that you notice it's green it's lush it's the it's the land that attracts him to go and live in sodom and so it's a beautiful place. In fact, the text tells us it's like the garden of God. In other words, it's like Eden. Yeah. But if you go to the Dead Sea today, it doesn't look like the garden of God. Yeah. And so what's happened? Well, the climate has changed. But was it man who did that? No. You see in the after effects of living in a post-flood world. And so after the flood, you get things like the Ice Age. And there's only one Ice Age biblically. And you, you see some of that in the book of Job. And so as, as Christians, we, we don't believe that man is the sole cause of climate change. Obviously, since the time of the flood, the flood has, has upset things. The flood would have caused the ice age, if, if you can understand um, that. And, you know, we shouldn't be worried because actually the climate is going to change in the future one day. And yeah. the person to bring that about is God. He will change the climate dramatically when he brings a day of judgment upon this earth. Yeah. And that's the climate change we all need to take into account. Yeah, for sure. There are some people that say that the biblical account of a flood has been copied from the epic of Gilgamesh. What do you say to those people? <laughs> you know, that's a common argument, David. I took my family a couple of months ago um, to a museum here in the UK in, in the city of Oxford called the Ashmolean Museum. And and one of their um, sort of designs there, they've got they've got um, some Mesopotamian things, some some of the artifacts from Mesopotamia. And one of the the um, uh, exhibits they have, that's the word I was looking for, exhibits, <laughs> is is of um, a little um, sort of cube, say um, a cube, which is called the Sumerian King List. It's based um, on a story about a great flood in the past. 
And there's another account called the Gilgamesh epic and, and, and other ones that obviously are well known. And those are stories that contain, you know, accounts about the flood and, and those, those dates for those things go back to at least, um, you know, around 2000 BC to 1600 BC. So many people would say, well, look, if, if Moses is the author of Genesis, well, those texts come before the account of um, Genesis, if, if Moses was the author of the Pentateuch or the Torah. And of, of course, we believe that he was as great evidence for that. But in the account of the Gilgamesh epic, David, it basically um, recounts um, the, the, a story about Gilgamesh, who was a tyrant, and he loses a, fen, a friend that was given to him from the gods. So he goes on basically a search for eternal life. And while he goes looking for eternal life, he bumps into um, a man called Utnapishnam and his wife. And they just, he finds out they've just survived this flood. The God, the gods basically help them get through this flood. And he, he, he meets Utnapishnam and Utnapishnam is basically the biblical Noah. Um, and he, he talks of him and basically goes on this, continues on his journey. He never finds um, this search for eternal life, and he goes back to being this tyrant king. But, you know, when you read the Gilgamesh epic, although it has a mention of a flood, it's not really a flood story. It's, it's all about this search for eternal life. But the thing is, the arc in the Gilgamesh epic is a perfect cube. It's um, 204 feet wide um, in height, um, and width. So it's a perfect cube. But that, if, if you believe that was true, then that cube would never survive yeah. a global flood. It, was just, it would collapse as soon as a wave hit, it would fall flat and it would break to bits because a perfect cube would never survive a global flood. And it's, and it's details like that that clearly tell us that this, this isn't a true account of the flood. What you see represented in the biblical text is actually a true account of the flood because the ark represented in there and that design of the ark in, in the biblical text by the way has been looked at by verified by independent scientists who are not christians and saying that is actually a seaworthy vessel yeah. and yeah. when you think about the account of the flood and the history in the bible i tell people look you don't need to be worried about these other accounts you find in the ancient near east because all they, all they tell us is that there was a flood yeah. <laughs> a yeah. flood really happened yeah. you know if you think if you think about biblical history what's the event that takes place after the flood the tower of babel and so what would happen well people who, who were at babel they would have remembered the tradition that was passed on to them about creation adam um the biblical flood and they would take that when they're dispersed from babel out into the various cultures and because we know what Paul teaches in Romans 1, that man suppresses the truth in unrighteousness, they would distort their accounts of the flood. And that's why you have all these different flood legends, not just in, in the ancient Near East, but all around the world. And all that does, David, is confirm in history there was a true global event. But that true account is, is recorded in the Bible because the Bible is given to us by the one true and living God. Yeah, brilliant. Another thing that a lot of people scoff at is that the Bible is actually the perfect and sufficient word of God. What would you say to anyone that is struggling with believing that it is God's word? Yeah, well, if, if, if you're a Christian, David, obviously what, what we all have in common as Christians is that Jesus is our Lord and Savior. So one of the first things I often do for people who are struggling with the belief that, look, that the Bible is the all sufficient word of God is just go to the Gospels and look at the teaching of Jesus and ask yourself, what did Jesus believe about the Old Testament? What did he believe about scripture? And you can read things like in Matthew 4, that every word of scripture comes from the mouth of God. And in that same chapter, when he's, um, Jesus has been confronted by Satan, how does he um, defeat Satan? Well, he uses scripture. Yeah. Um, he tells Satan, it is written, it is written. He uses the power of scripture to, to defeat Satan. And then, you know, when you listen to his sermon on the Mount, he talks about every um, jot and tittle of, of scripture. You know, he, Jesus believed in yeah. even the words of scripture, um, the letters on the page 
were inspired. You know, that's better than many theologians' understanding of Scripture today. They want to try and say, well, maybe it's just the ideas, it's the concepts. But for Jesus, yeah. it's um, the very words, the very letters of Scripture that come from God. And there's, there's other examples in Scripture, you know, where Jesus tells us in John 10, 35, that Scripture cannot be broken in other words it's all sufficient it's all powerful for everything that we need but then you just need to look as well david you know if you think about all the accounts that we have in the bible that are ridiculed by scholars today whether it be creation adam noah um lot sodom and gomorrah jonah all those accounts jesus talks about in the gospels and not one does he not once does he ever say you know that was just a myth yeah. That was just a parable. Yeah. He clearly believed that they were true historical events, and he always used them to, to reemphasize the historical text and trustworthiness of the Old Testament. And so I say to people, look, if you're tr troubled by all these different theologians, ask yourself, what did the Lord Jesus believe? Because if you're trusting in him for your salvation, then you also need to be able to trust his view of Scripture, and so that's where I would point people to. And again, I, I pull apart, um, or not pull apart, maybe that's the wrong way to say it, but I look at what um, the Apostle Peter tells us about Scripture, that holy men spoke through, um, spoke by God, the Holy Spirit moved those men to write Scripture. And so one of the reasons we know that um, Scripture is without error, because people often say, but yeah, but men wrote the Bible. And that's true. Men did. God used real people. Moses um, Peter, Paul, to write scripture, but they didn't just write it by themselves. They were moved by the Holy Spirit to write those very words of scripture. And of course, the Apostle Paul tells us in 2 Timothy 3.16 that all scripture is breathed out by God. So that tells us about the origin of scripture. Scripture comes from God himself. And so that's why we can trust the message of the Bible. Yeah, excellent. How does the education system within the UK influence the next generation of Christians when it comes to creation and the flood and even the Christian faith in general? Well, I think the thing we need to realise, David, about um, the education system, whether you're in the UK or anywhere in the Western world, it's governed by Darwinian evolution. It's governed by a philosophy of naturalism. And so if your children are going to those places for their education, you need to realize they're being discipled by someone. They're being discipled by people who teach a philosophy of naturalism, the philosophy of Darwinian evolution. And those ideas don't allow for the supernatural creation of the world by God. They don't allow for a real historical Adam. They don't allow for Adam's sin bringing death and suffering into the world. They don't allow for a global flood. And so if your children are going to those places, and by the way, no matter who teaches your children, they never teach from a position of neutrality because the Bible teaches there's no such thing as a neutral worldview. And wherever your children go to school, they will be receiving a worldview. And so you have to ask the question, what worldview are my children receiving? And so if they're in a, a, a government school, a state school, then they're going to be by and large be given those ideas and those will contradict the biblical ideas of creation and the flood and david i would say one of the reasons many many people in the church struggle with these issues today in fact why there's a whole generation of people young people missing from the church is because they they've basically been disciples to yeah. believe evolution in millions of years and because they believe in evolution in millions of years they don't believe the biblical account of creation and the flood and it's why they often stop and say that's just a book of mythology those events never happen because they've been trained to think in different ideas and so if you're a parent if you're um, a pastor of the church you need to realize that and think well the way to combat that is by using the biblical account to demolish the strongholds of evolution and millions of years as the apostle paul tells us in um second corinthians 10 5 you know we are to destroy arguments um that are raised up against the knowledge of god and how do you destroy those arguments you use the power of the word of god and so that's what we need to be doing in our churches we need to be preaching and teaching the truth of god's word and we can use the scientific evidence we can use the evidence to show look this verifies what we read in the word of god yeah 
Bearing this in mind, how should mums and dads listening, as well as those within the church, help and educate and disciple our children, approach, discuss and correct things that are being taught as fact, but are against what we are reading in scripture? Well, you, you know, David, in, in, in the introduction to my book, I give an example um, of someone who calls himself um, a researcher into creationism. He's an agnostic in the UK. He's a reporter from, for one of the major newspapers. And basically, when he talks about creation and the flood, he basically just distorts what the Bible teaches on the issue of creation and the flood. And I say, look, this is typical of many people when they come to the Bible. They never look at the Bible really to say what it says in its context, to, to you know, to its teaching throughout Scripture. They, they just sort of pick and choose various bits of the Bible, try and twist them, them a little bit to put their flavor on it. And I say, look, if, if you've got children, if you've got young people in your church, you know, open up the Bible with them, look at the, some of the issues that they're going through, whether it's creation or the flood or whatever it is, the issues in the Gospels, and just open up the text of Scripture, read it in its context, and allow the text to speak to the people. And then say, look, what are some of the objections that you're going through? What are some of the objections that you're facing? For example, lots of um, children, we get this argument all the time from young people or from people who've been through the education system. Noah couldn't have taken all the species of animal that we see in the world today on the ark, that would be an impossibility. And we say, yeah, that's true. That would be impossible. But Noah didn't have to take every species of animal onto the ark because first of all, he didn't take species onto the ark. He took kinds of animals. And that would relate to um, basically our family classification that we have today. And Noah didn't have to take, he, he had to take two of every land breathing animal onto the ark he didn't have to take the whales you know the dolphins um uh, things like that onto the ark he only had to take certain animals yeah. on to the ark so when 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 your young people are facing these problems just get them to look closely at the text think about the objection that's been raised and then try and think it through logically with them and if you need to go and find helpful resources there's there's thousands of articles on answers in genesis.org which will help you deal with some of these problems that they may be facing in their education system. But the best way to do it, David, is just think about the problem logically with them, take them to the text of scripture and think it through with them. Because of these things, uh, a lot of Christians have been wrestling with the um, curriculum at school and a lot of Christians are exploring or have taken their kids out of school and have um, gone into home education. I know this is something you're really passionate about, Simon. Um, yeah. Just tell us about the benefits of that. And also, I know you've written a book that's been really helpful and we're, you know, my family are a, a testimony to that as well. But just quickly tell us about your book as well, because I think it'd be really helpful at this point. Yeah, so when when my wife and I first, um, you know, we got married and, you know, you, you're thinking about having children, the big question runs through your mind, well, what are we going to do when it comes to their education? And we realised just because of the nature of the school system and the fact that I said already, there's no such thing as neutrality, that the, sending them to the government's state education was was never an option for us because we knew of the hostility towards the biblical worldview. And we wanted our children to learn in an environment which would teach them, give them a, a, basically a, a Christian education. And by that, I don't mean where you just sort of pour a little salt and pepper on the top and then you know teach them everything that they learn in, in the government schools, but it's a holistic view of education from a Christian point of view. And I entitled the book, leading them out because the word educate actually comes historically um, from a Latin word educere to lead out and the question behind that is what are you leading your children out of well classically that had to do with the idea of leading um, the child out of darkness the darkness of a fallen world into the light of of the word of the world of God and that's what we want to do with our children we want to expose them to the truth of God's word. And you need to, to realize if they go into, especially today, to government schools, state schools, wherever you are in the Western world, then they're going to be taught a different philosophy of history. You're going to learn about um, Darwinism, which is basically the philosophy of atheism. They're going to be teaching neo-Marxism, um, critical race theory, 
Um, they're going to get all the LGBTQ ideology. And that's not a helpful environment for any child, never mind Christian children, to learn in. And when you think about those things, they're in, really an assault on the glory of God. And so from my point of view, I think the Bible teaches that we should be given our children a Christian education. And a Christian education allows your children to, to you know, breathe in their education and not suffocated with all these um different ideas but you know when it comes to those ideas david we we actually teach our children evolution we teach them it warts and all because we want them to understand what people in the world believe yeah. so that they can go out there and embrace yeah. those you know they can sorry not embrace those arguments but tackle those arguments they can take them head on and teach people about the gospel of jesus christ amazing i know you draw much of your studies from second peter chapter three there are some people that actually argue that simon peter was not the author of this book what are your thoughts on that <laughs> yeah that's that's a, a can be a common argument by a, a number of scholars that you know peter didn't even write the book um it was probably written well after him you know because the lang the lack the, the greek it's written in it's it's too bombastic for it to be you know a, a, a poor fisherman from galilee and they, they talk about all these different contradictions between first Peter and second Peter and, and so on and so forth. But if you just read the text, um, the, the author is clearly mentioned or identifies himself as Peter. In fact, that the form um, of Simeon Peter that's used is only ever used in one other place in the Bible in Acts chapter 15. I don't remember the very verse um, on the top of my head, um, but that's the same form as in two Peter, and it's the same person. And he, and he identifies himself um, not only in name, but he mentions the fact that, look, he was with the Lord on the Mount of Transfiguration. He was there. He saw those events. He talks about the fact that his death is, is at close at hand. And, you know, when Peter was in the Gospel of John, Jesus actually tells Peter how he's going to die and so, you know, it's clearly Peter recounting that event from the time that he's with Jesus. And he also mentions the fact that he's a close associate of the, the Apostle Paul. He talks at the very end in chapter three and verse 16 about the Apostle Paul's writings, about the Apostle Paul's scripture writings. And so he obviously knew the Apostle Paul. So if, you know, people say, well, maybe this was someone writing under a false name, a pseudonym. But that would be hard, you know, that would be a hard stretch to say all those things and yet say it was someone writing under a false name. And yet you want to say at the same time it's scripture. Um, that's trying to say we should believe in falsehood. But clearly that's not the case. When you read the, the text of two Peter, it's clearly the author of Peter. And that was confirmed um, well on in the church. And I, I will say this one thing. David, because many people may not know this. Actually, Second Peter, um, that there was some trouble for for um, early Christians accepting it into the canon, and that wasn't because they didn't just think it wasn't from Peter, but because they wanted to examine things closely. And there were lots of other texts around at the time, um, the Gnostic Gospel of Peter and some other Gospels that were named. Um, as Peter as the author and so they wanted to check these things out yeah they didn't just accept any old thing into the canon but once they realized the content of the letter who wrote the letter the the argument he was using they accepted it into the canon um, with no problem yeah two Peter warns us about false teachers who will come into the church and twist things give us some examples within the scope of your book that is taught incorrectly from pulpits today regarding creation and the flood well, I think we've already we've mentioned some of the facts, um, you know, that the idea that um, the world's billions of years old, um, there never was a global flood. These are the, the two main things um, that are taught in our pulpit when it comes to, to creation and the flood. Many preachers will will stand off these issues that, you know, they'll say something like, well, it's just too controversial. We don't want to touch on these things. There's, there's lots of different opinions there in the church. And so let's not talk about it. And so I, I say, well, open up, I'll open up the Bible. And that's what I've tried to do with two Peter. I've opened up the text of Peter. This is a New Testament text, which clearly teaches us about the supernatural creation of the world um, in Genesis one and its destruction through a global flood 
in Genesis 6 to 8. And so Peter uses those events to actually counteract the argument of the scoffers who basically, David, interestingly, use the argument that Jesus isn't going to come and, and, and return again because they say all things continue as they were since the beginning of creation. And that argument, David, is very similar to the modern argument of uniformitarianism, which basically tells us that the rates and conditions in the world that we see today have always been the same. And that argument was given us, it was really popularized by a man called Charles Lyell. He, he basically laid the foundation for that argument. And he wrote um, to a, a series of books called The Principles of of geology really given us this emphasis on the um, idea that the world is millions of years old, that it's not thousands of years old. And that book or, or those series of books were taken on to the Beagle, um, Charles Darwin's trip around the you know South America onto that boat. And Darwin actually consumed those books. And by the, by the time he got to South America, he was already convinced of the idea of the great age for the earth so people don't realize actually the historical background to this and they don't even realize look he's a text in the new testament that clearly deals with this argument that is used by scoffers yeah. outside and inside the church today look all things continue those rock layers were laid down slowly over millions of years yada 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 but actually peter says no god has intervened he's intervened through the supernatural creation of the world and he's intervened through the destruction of that same world because of wickedness of man through the global flood. And so yeah, yeah. we need to be using those arguments. We need to be preaching that truth in our churches today. And I, and I say in one of my chapters on, on the issue of the authorship of Peter, that Peter is a controversial book because of the nature of its teaching, because it deals with false teachers. You know, many people don't want to preach on to Peter because of its controversy. But that's the very reason we need to preach yeah. from Second Peter, because false teachers are real and they wreak havoc in the church. Sure. Some people listening, including some of those that are in Christ, will hold on to different positions. They'll point out that these things are secondary understandings and not a matter of salvation. But why are you so passionate about holding the line on this, Simon? Well, you can be a Christian, David, and believe in millions of years you can be a christian and believe that god used evolution but you can't be a consistent christian i i would say because you just need to look at um some of the people who hold those positions who are really influential in the church today they start to deny the inspiration of scripture the full inspiration of scripture the inerrancy of scripture because they realize you know you can't believe in in biblical inerrancy and believe in millions of years at the same time because it just doesn't go together many people have started to deny that there was a first man called adam well if you deny there was a historical adam who was supernaturally created by god then you also have to redefine what sin is because if adam is part of an evolutionary chain of people then obviously sin death suffering disease came into the world before him but that does away with the biblical argument by the apostle paul in Romans 5 and 1 Corinthians 15, that sin and death came into the world because of Adam. And then you have to define doctrines like original sin and lots of other doctrines. You yeah. know, I've, I've even heard Christians say things like this. Well, Jesus seemed to believe in creation and the flood, but you need to realize that although Jesus was God, he was also a human. And in his humanity, he would have accommodated to the people of his time. Yeah. You know, these are, the, these are the reasons why we need the whole fast to scripture, that we need to believe what scripture says. This, these are not just secondary and tertiary issues. This is the primary issue because we're talking about what God did at the beginning of creation. And creation sets the theme for the rest of the Bible. You know, there's a, there's a road all the way from Eden that stretches through the entire um, theme of scripture we talk about creation full redemption and new creation and if you pull out a thread of scripture um, you begin to unravel it and once you do away with 
the biblical teaching of creation and the flood, then you, you're going to undermine the authority of scripture throughout its teaching, especially yeah. when it comes to the creation or the recreation of all things in the new heaven and the new earth. Yeah. Yeah. Denying these true biblical truths don't only leave the back door open, but it leaves all the windows open as well, Simon, right? Absolutely. That's a, that's a good way to, yeah. to put it there. That's a good analogy. You can use that, Simon. You can quote me on that. <laughs> that that'll be in my next book. <laughs> <laughs> you and your team spend a lot of time engaged in apologetics. And in a way, it's not a case of trying to convince someone of a more superior set of facts. It's more a case of holding up a mirror, isn't it, through scripture for this person to realise that they're actually suppressing the truth that they know in their heart that there is a God and that they are living in rebellion to him, right? Yeah, um, if you look at how the biblical authors argue, especially the Apostle Paul, I think he does that when he goes to, when it's in Acts 14, when he's dealing with the pagans there, or when he's in Acts 17, speaking to the philosophical um, theologian, or you know, philosophers on Mars Hill. He, he, he uses the truth of creation to undermine the arguments of the age, and he does that in a really clever way because you know as we said god's revealed himself in such a way in creation that if people don't believe in him they're without excuse that's his theology in romans one and that people suppress that truth yeah. you know that that suppression is going to show up somewhere in their argument and one of the things i point out in the book i thought that was really interesting this you know from the famous atheist richard dawkins um he wrote in a book called um, the river out of Eden. Um, I think it was 1998. He he talked about the fact that there's no good and evil in this, in the world. There's nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. And that was his evolutionary argument. There's no good. There's no evil. It's just blind, um, pitiless indifference. And he says DNA just is, and we just dance to its music. And that I think he wrote that book in about 1998, 1999. But interest. Interestingly, David, in 2006, and people in the UK will may be aware of this, he made um, a television program on Channel 4 called The Root of All Evil, and he was basically talking about religion. Well, that's interesting. He called his program The Root of All Evil, but six or seven years ago in a book, he said there was no such thing as good or evil. So if there's no such thing as good or evil, when, why are you talking about religion as being evil? Yeah. See, that's the, the inconsistency of the unbelieving worldview. It, it contradicts itself. Richard Dawkins cannot consistently as an atheist believe in evil because of the nature of his naturalistic Darwinian worldview. But, but because he lives in God's world and he's suppressing that truth, he realizes when he looks around the world and sees all these awful events going on, that's evil. There's yeah. something wrong. When people kill each other, that's not a good thing. And, and he can't get out of that. He, and he has to deal with that and he ends up calling it evil but he needs to realize that's a contradiction in his own naturalistic worldview and that's what we should be doing with unbelievers we should be saying look you're a creature of god you're suppressing the truth and this is how you're suppressing it look you want to talk about good you want to talk about evil but if you're an atheist logically you can't believe in those things but this is why you believe in them because you're a creature of god and you're suppressing that truth and unrighteous and that's why you need to turn from your sin and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, brilliant. We live in an age right now waiting for Christ to return, but even this point is scoffed at. And you mentioned in your book through a study conducted by Ligonier that almost one in four evangelical Christians do not believe that Christ will return. Why is it important that Christians hold on to a robust understanding of the second coming? Well, if we don't believe um, Christ will return, David, well, then we really are, as Paul would put it, still in our sins we have no hope in this world if christ is not going to return if he's not going to come back to judge the living and the dead if he's not going to come back to restore creation then we like everyone else will be pitied above all people and i point out in the book i think the reason many people you know that that's a shocking statistic when you know that many christians can say that they're not sure whether christ will come back well that just is is part of the whole sort of Darwinian worldview, because once you undermine the beginning of scripture, it will ripple through the rest of scripture and people begin to doubt. They begin to think, well, if, if creation isn't true, well, why should I believe redemption is true? And so Peter actually tells us, look, 
you can be confident Christ will return. We saw him on the Mount of Transfiguration. And that was basically anticipating, Peter says, his second coming. We saw him. and We can be sure he will come again. And Peter, again, as I say, he uses creation and the flood to undermine the scoffers' argument. And he points out, look, the scoffers live lives of, of sexual immorality, but we are to live holy and godly lives while they mock at us because what do we look forward to? We look forward to the consummation of all things. We look forward to the new heavens and the new earth in which righteousness dwells. And what I try and point out in the view, uh, sorry, in the book, David, is that, you know, evolution isn't just about the beginning of the world. It's about the end of the world. Evolutionists have an eschatology and we won't get into eschatology tonight. But, you know, when all Christians agree, there'll be a new heavens and a new earth. No Christian fights about that. We all believe that Christ will come and one day there will be a transformation of creation where we will live with him in righteousness. But in the evolutionary worldview, that that doesn't happen. Yeah. You know, there's what they call a, a, a cosmic heat death when all the available energy that's in the universe is used up and everything just dies out in a cold, empty space. That That isn't a glorious future at all to look forward to. And so if you're a Christian, think about this. And if you believe God used the Big Bang and if you used millions of years of evolution, then why wouldn't you hold consistently to the fact that actually, well, if I'm consistent, there isn't going to be a new heavens and a new earth because everything will just die in cold, empty space. Yeah. And you need to think about the consistency of your worldview because just as creation was brought into um existence supernaturally in six days well the new heavens and new earth it won't take six days but god will supernaturally bring the new heavens and new earth into existence it will not yeah. take millions of years for it to be inaugurated yeah yeah but try, if, you, if you hold to that view of millions of years as a christian well you're going to be inconsistent there yeah yeah, for sure. We live in an age where the seeker sensitive movement has infiltrated pulpits all across our land where hell, sin and judgment are not mentioned from one year to another. What does the Bible say about the judgment of those outside of Christ? And how can we present the gospel as good news when people do not know what the bad news is? That, that's precisely um, what we do need to do, David, because if you, if you don't, people talk about, yeah, we need to share the gospel with people, you know, forget all about this Genesis stuff. We just need to go out and tell people that Jesus is their savior. But if, if you're going to understand the good news, the good news, the Bible says is so good precisely because the bad news yes. is so bad. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if I never knew I was a sinner, then yeah. why would I look for a savior? And that's the thing you need to realize, as Paul says, you're either in Adam or you're in Christ. You can't just tell people about Christ. You need to say, look, this is the problem. You're in Adam. You're a sinful person. You've broken the law of God. And God will judge sin justly. And you don't want to be held accountable for your sin without a savior. Yeah. Because you will have to fall into the hands of the living God. And the Bible says to fall into the hands of the living God is a fearful and terrible thing and so if we're going to go out and preach the gospel david we need to first tell people look there's the bad news and this is the bad news you know sin and death came into the world through adam you've been separated from god and the only way for that separation to be restored is by accepting what the last adam the lord jesus christ did when he came to this earth he lived a perfect life of obedience towards god the father he kept the law perfectly he went to the cross of calvary as a substitutionary uh, atoning sacrifice he paid the penalty for sin he rose from the grave three days after he was put to death and when he rose from the dead he conquered sin and death and that's how we can be made right with god paul talks about you know when christ was resurrected that is, he was resurrected for our justification and so there is a real day of judgment and you know lots of people want to deny the doctrine of hell because they can't believe that god would be so unloving in their words but it's precisely that fact because god is loving and he is a just god that he has to take sin seriously yeah and so there is a real place uh, of judgment in fact you know this is what peter's talking about in his book there is a judgment to come yeah. there is a judgment day that is coming in the future and we need to prepare for it and we need to go out onto the streets 
And, you know, with our friends and family members, warn them if they don't know the Lord Jesus, look, there is a day of judgment to come. And here's the interesting thing, David. We can say, look, here's how we know God is going to judge again, because he judged in the past. He judged the world in the past. Yeah. And here's how I know that. The Bible tells us he judged through a flood, and here's the evidence for it. Yeah. Look at those rock layers. They contain fossils, dead things, and that's the evidence of God's judgment. Yeah, and the yeah. Bible tells us he's going to he's going to do as he's going to do that again, but it won't be through a flood. It'll be by fire next time. And so we need to be prepared for that judgment. But think about it. This is Peter's argument. If you if you if you if you do away with the judgment of the flood, when why would you believe in a judgment to come? And the very fact, you know, many people can just, you know, mock Christianity, mock what the Bible says about creation and the flood is because they don't think those events took place. And if those events didn't take place, well, why would there be a judgment to come? Yeah. You know, I think I mentioned this at the beginning, I was on the streets on a Saturday um, sharing the gospel with people. And while some people stop and want to interact with you, lots of people just walk on by, Oh, I've heard that nonsense before. It's all a myth. Um, you know, haven't you heard of science? You know, you people need to get a life. You know, you just, silly people and they use worse words than that but you know they do that because they think the bible is a book of mythology they don't believe god judged in the past and if they don't believe that then why would they believe god yeah. judged in the future and this is why in our churches because it needs to start in our churches that we need to be teaching people the, the truth of genesis foundationally or the culture won't get it yeah yeah so good you draw out in your book the patience of god what can you tell us about that? Yeah, it's um, I, I have a whole chapter on that. When I looked into to, to the um, the Greek word macro, for me, I th thought it was a really interesting word that Peter had used, and it's used throughout the the, the scriptures, uh, David. Because one of the things that I think is interesting is that many people, like Richard Dawkins, talk about this angry God in Scripture. He just wants to punish sins. But one of the things that were taught um, taught in scripture is that God is patient. He's, he's rich in mercy and he's slow to anger. And the Greek word uh, um, is macrothemia. It comes, is made up of two Greek words, macro meaning big or massive and theme meaning anger. And so God has a massive capacity to contain his anger at sin. And that's amazing when you think about it. Yeah. The fact that God can control that massive anger at sin because he has every right every right as a holy god to be angry at our our sin but he contains it he's patient towards us or some translations of the bible say he's long suffering and when you think about the, the time of the flood peter tells us he waited patiently in 1 peter 3 20 he waited patiently in the time of the flood he didn't just wipe humanity out you know throw a big thunderbolt down as, as richard dawkins likes to to caricature the flood and destroy everyone no he saw the wickedness of man and it was evil every thought intention of man's heart was wicked all the time and yet he was patient yeah he didn't give man what he deserved the moment he deserved it he was patient and i bring out you know if you look at the account of, of jonah and the ninevites which looks back to the time of the Exodus and the golden calf incident when the people had just been delivered from Egypt. And one of the first things they do is, you know, you read that and think, how can it be so silly to commit idolatry? You've just seen God work through your very midst. And yet here you are committing idolatry. And yet you read Moses intercedes before God and God is patient. He doesn't, treat the people of israel as their sins deserved and yet you know we with the patience of the lord is all throughout scripture we, we need to get rid of this caricature of god he's an angry ogre no he contains his, his yeah. anger yeah and it's not like the anger of man the bible says you know it talks about the anger of man it does not produce the righteousness of god our our anger is just flippant it's out of control it comes at a whim it's based upon our rational emotions but that's not like god's anger yeah. when god judges and he's angry at people it's for a just reason it's for a right cause but it tells us he's patient 
and he's patient. And, he, and Peter tells us the patience of the Lord means salvation. Now, that's something for us all to think about. The patience of the Lord means salvation. The very fact that Christ has not returned yet tells us of God's patience towards yeah. mankind. He's patient towards us, and it's a day of salvation. Yeah. And that should be a, a warning for us as Christians. Make the most of this time of the patience of the Lord because it's an opportunity to let other people know who are outside of Christ of the, the patience of our Lord and the yeah, salvation amen. that comes amen. through the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. yeah, so good. What advice would you have for church leaders that have scoffers within their congregation? Well, the, the way to, to, to deal with scoffers is by confronting them. And you can confront them in love, in truth. Um, you know, you, you take them to the word of God and say, look, this is what the word of God says. And you expose them to the word of God because Peter tells us, look, scoffers are very much um, a trouble in the church, that they, they work their way into the church, they get into the church, and they start wreaking havoc. And so you need to deal with them. If, you, if you'll just let them go, that they'll wreck your church. They, they take over households, Paul tells us in Timothy, um, they try and um, work on people's emotions. They try and deceive people. Um, and, you know, Jude mentions the false teachers that come in. He, he tells us that they're devoid of the Holy Spirit. They reject apostolic doctrine. And so as a pastor, as a teacher, you need to, to be um, grounded upon Scripture. You need to know what God's Word tells us, and you need to be able to expose um, the false teachers to the Word of God. In, in hope that God would grant them repentance, as Paul talks about in Timothy, that, yeah. you know, patiently rebuke them, but rebuke them in the hope that God will grant them repentance. But you do need, with false teachers come into your church, then you need to stand strong with the leadership in your church yeah. and, and make sure you expose them to the truth of God's word, but expose them to the con say, look, these people are teaching falsehood. Yeah. Brilliant. Not only do you write really helpful books, you also, through Answers in Genesis, go around the country holding events and speaking at churches. How do people go about booking you and the other speakers that you have on your team? Um, yeah, they can go to our website, davidanswersandgenesis.org. And if they go um, to the bottom of the website, you'll see the contact list. And if you just go there, you'll see the, the contact information that you can get hold of. You can email us through that information or you can call the uk office through our contact details that are on the website phone us up and speak to the folks in our office and we can come uh, and speak at your church either on a sunday during the week or we can hold a saturday conference you know look i just spoke at a conference in um, the cotswolds at a baptist church um, a few weeks ago and they wanted to make a whole day of it and they found that that was um, really helpful for them because there's so much to talk about it's really hard to do it <laughs> sometimes in, in one in yeah. one talk but you know a day conference can often help and people really find that beneficial for them brilliant well simon as always i've really enjoyed having you on to talk about your new book scoffers i'm going to make sure that we've got the link to your book and your home education book leading them out in the description below before you go do you have any closing thoughts um, yeah, I just encourage people, um, if they're out there, this is the book, um, Scoffers um, of Creation and the Flood. You can go to our web store if you're in the UK, answersandgenesis.org. Well, that'll actually take, it doesn't matter where you are in the world, that will take you to the right web store. You know, get the book, get it into your hands um, of people in your church who, who need to think about this. Um, because I, I think I've done a helpful job maybe <laughs> in taking people through that book of the Bible and showing you yeah. why um, this is a paramount issue in the church that we need to deal with. You know, people will say it's a side issue, secondary issue, but I hope the book shows one thing. This is paramount. This is first importance. We need to deal with this issue and we need to deal with it head on because it has caused havoc. It has caused problems within the church because we we've forgotten what scripture tells us when it comes to this issue peter is so so clear that god created the world supernaturally and he destroyed it through a global flood and we look forward to the new heavens 
and the new earth. And all those things are supernatural events, supernatural events. There's no evolution behind them. Yeah. And so we need to, to, to believe what God has given to us in his word. And so I just encourage people, even if you don't get the book, just open up the book of um, to Peter. Look at chapter three, just study it, take your time, go through it. It will be a blessing yeah. and encouraging to you. And it will help you deal with the false arguments that we see out there today. Another great blessing is the work that you do for your Answers in Genesis Facebook page. You share these amazing articles all for free, almost on a daily basis as well. And um, how do people follow that page, Simon? Yeah, and maybe we can put a link there to our Facebook page. If they just go to Facebook and look for search for Answers in Genesis UK Europe, um, we try and put several articles out a day. Um, some scripture verses that may be encouraging or, you know, things that are in the news to, to help believers um, with the truth of God's uh, word. And I'd also say, David, um, that we have at the ministry um, for families um, a streaming service called Answers TV. I don't know if you've subscribed to that. Um, you get a free subscription. Sorry, not a free sub. You get a seven day trial free so you can view Answers tv it's a it's a it's a streaming christian streaming service you know there's so much um rubbish out there on tv today and you have netflix and all these other programs which is a lot of really what is promoted on there is really immoral and so answers tv is a great christian platform there's lots of great teaching on there biblical teaching christian documentaries um all sorts of different things that I would encourage people to go and have a look at um, and introduce that to your family, because that will be a great blessing to you. There's lots of good Christian um, information and teaching on Answers TV. Oh, you're writing another book at the moment. I don't know if that's top secret. So are we allowed to mention that? Yeah, well, I'm writing a book on Adam. I, I wrote a book, actually, David, a couple of years ago, Adam the first and the last. And over the last few years, I thought, you know what, I could have put this in, I could have put that in. And there's all these different arguments coming out today. And so I asked the publishers, look, can I, can I redo this book? Can I republish it? Because I think I just, I can do a better job and I can, so much more I can add. So maybe hopefully next year, there's, I'm going to have another book coming out called Adam, the first and the last. And so it deals with um, the issues there in Genesis, in Genesis chapter one, two, and three. Um, some of the chronology that's there in the Old Testament, but also when it comes to Jesus, we deal with his humanity, his ministry, his deity. Um, we look at some, you know, you know what Jesus believed about Scripture. We've already talked about that, and we, you know, pull that um, out a bit more in the book. Yeah. So yeah, I'm very much looking forward um, to bringing that out. And I've also actually got another booklet. Um, coming out probably the same size of my booklet on education maybe just a bit bigger on islam um, um engage in islam and we look at the origins of islam in that i look at um uh the quran what that teaches contrasted with the bible their doctrine of god and um, their view of jesus the view of the cross the view of sin and salvation and so you know it, islam is a big thing in the west at the moment and so yeah, I, in a few months, hopefully that'll be out on our yeah, web store. Yeah. Well, it's another excuse to get you back onto the show. And we'll have to give you a hat trick ball at that point, Simon. So <laughs> we can look forward to that. One last thing is this now feels like a massive Simon Turpin promotional advert. But I also know you've got a conference coming out. Are we going to miss that? Is that is that next weekend or you've got a big conference coming out online, right? Yeah, it's our normally, David, we do our mega conferences um, in public, you know, a, a, a great conference center in the West Midlands here in the UK, which we normally have over 1200 people attend. But because of the uncertainties with COVID and some people still having restrictions and, you know, what will the coming months hold for us this year, we decided to do it online. And so that's actually available on Answers TV. Maybe we can put a link in, in here and it's a three day event. It's um Thursday the 28th of October, Friday the 29th of October. There's three sessions on both of those evenings, on Thursday and Friday evening. The conference will start at 7 o'clock British Standard Time. And then on Saturday the 30th of October, there's seven talks um, throughout the day. And, and we're going to be talking about so much over those three days. It's, it's not just creation and the flood. It's the authority of Scripture 
Um, we've even got um, an astronaut speaking for us um, who's actually is in space right now and he recorded a talk for us, Captain Barry Wilmore, yeah. who's a NASA astronaut. Yeah. And he's gonna he's given us amazing sort of background into his work at NASA and you know why he's a Christian and why he believes in the biblical account of creation. So that that in itself is is reason to to look into it. Amazing. Well, we'll have the link of that in the description below as well. So I mean, thanks again for your time. I've really enjoyed it. Thanks, David, for having me. It's been great to be with you. Brilliant. Thank you.